Defeating Darwinism by Opening Minds, Chapter 3, Part 2 Sagan's Bluff Let's take Richard Feynman as our prime example of a truly scientific thinker and ask ourselves what he would say about the following statement by Carl Sagan. The quoted statement comes from Sagan's final book, The Demon Haunted World, the same book where he urges us not to be impressed by invocations of authority and to insist on asking whether claims put forward in the name of science are really testable. I meet many people who are offended by evolution, who passionately prefer to be the personal handicraft of God than to arise by blind physical and chemical forces over aeons from slime. They also tend to be less than assiduous in exposing themselves to the evidence. Evidence has little to do with it. What they wish to be true, they believe is true. Only 9% of Americans accept the central finding of modern biology that human beings, and all other species, have slowly evolved by natural processes from a succession of more ancient beings with no divine intervention needed along the way. Sagan here turns his baloney detector around. It's no longer a light to protect us from a snow job. It's a club to browbeat us into believing, against our better judgment, that humans arose by blind physical and chemical forces over eons from slime. This central finding comes, mind you, from a scientific establishment that also insists that it isn't saying anything about God. The statement has the form of critical thinking. It speaks of people who ignore evidence and believe what they want to believe, but there is no real attempt to reason. Is it really likely that 91% of the public disagrees with Sagan for no reason at all? Let's consider two possibilities. One is that 91% of the public consists of ignorant people who ignore the evidence and just believe what they want to believe. On that assumption, democracy is a farce. We are like children who think we can set fires and not be burned. In that case, we ought to be ruled by a scientific elite who will protect us from the consequences of our folly. The other possibility is that the evolutionary naturalists are the ones who believe what they want to believe, and that they are likewise the ones who are less than assiduous in exposing themselves to contrary evidence. Maybe Carl Sagan ignored Richard Feynman's warning. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. Education or Indoctrination In a dictatorship, the dictator tells the people what they are supposed to believe. In a democracy, we try to educate citizens so that they can reason for themselves. That doesn't mean we treat all answers as equally correct. The claim that 2 plus 2 equals 5 is not a dissenting opinion. It's a mistake. But we don't have to force people to believe the truths of arithmetic. If they are properly educated, they will accept them by reason. Democracy rests on the faith that ordinary people can be trusted with the powers of government if education teaches them to think rationally. This implies a democratic concept of education. When good teachers are teaching more advanced problems in mathematics or in other subjects, they love a student who will argue that the textbook answer isn't correct. The reason isn't so much that textbook answers might be wrong, although that always is a possibility. The real reason is that people learn the truth best if they fully understand the objections to the truth. If I believe in evolution or anything else only because teacher says so, you could say I don't really believe in evolution. What I believe in is obedience to authority and in letting teacher do my thinking for me. A democratic education aims to produce citizens who can think for themselves. Carl Sagan would have agreed emphatically and would have said that unquestionably acceptance of the dictates of authority is the opposite of the kind of skeptical thinking science education ought to try to foster. Except, of course, when it comes to evolutionary naturalism. Given that only a small minority of Americans believe the central findings of biology, that human beings and all other species have slowly evolved by natural processes from a succession of more ancient beings with no divine intervention needed along the way, 
How should our educational system deal with this important instance of disagreement between the experts and the people? One way would be to treat the doubts of the people with respect, to bring them out in the open and to deal with them rationally. The opposite way is to tell the people that all doubts about naturalistic evolution are inherently absurd, that they should believe in the orthodox theory because the experts agree that it is correct and that their silly misgivings will be allowed no hearing in public education. American educators have chosen the second path, the path of Sagan's Bluff. I'll illustrate that with two examples that occurred in 1996. The Lakewood case. A high school senior in Lakewood, a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio, wrote an editorial in the school paper in appreciation of physics teacher Mark Wisniewski. Wisniewski, a creationist, used a classroom exercise in which students were asked to think about how their own worldviews influenced their interpretations of the debate between creation science and the more orthodox scientific views of cosmology and biological evolution. The student later observed that Wisniewski never stood on a soapbox and never made us feel like we were in a Bible study. The philosophical element is what made it special. Wisniewski wanted us to make up our own minds rather than spoon feed us like other educators. According to a commendably fair-minded article in the anti-creationist magazine, Skeptical Inquirer, Wisniewski himself explained, I tried to find something in the science arena that would raise the worldview issues, and the creation-evolution debate fits like a glove. Ask whether any other issue might illustrate his point as well without bringing religious debates into the classroom. Wisniewski argued that it is important that the dispute goes to core beliefs or the example wouldn't really hit home. He said his goal was to teach students how to interpret data on their own, not just memorize and regurgitate favorite interpretations of the teacher. He graded on how students supported their ideas, not on the ultimate answers they gave. Unwittingly, the student got her favorite teacher in a peck of trouble by publicizing his teaching objectives and methods. No students in the class or their parents complained, but calls from out of town flooded the district's office. Lawyers from the ACLU threatened the district with expensive litigation, and the district's own counsel advised administrators that they had better issue a directive forbidding teachers to raise the religious issues. Facing a lawsuit and public controversy that would distract it from everything else, the district capitulated and ordered the teacher to stop. The response to Danny Phillips. At the end of the previous chapter, I told you the story of Danny Phillips, the Denver high school student who startled his teachers by challenging teaching materials that present evolution as a fact. What he was challenging, of course, was the broad theory of evolution as defined by the National Association of Biology Teachers, an unsupervised, impersonal, unpredictable, and natural process that accounts for the entire history of life. Danny challenged evolutionary naturalism on two grounds. It is effectively a religious dogma, and it isn't supported by the weight of the scientific evidence. The school's administrators, impressed by Danny's arguments, initially ordered the offending film replaced by other teaching materials. Danny's case ended like so many others. He lost because the power was on the other side. Self-styled civil liberties lawyers threatened to bring an expensive lawsuit, and the school board capitulated to them. Before that happened, however, Danny's challenge to evolutionary orthodoxy got a lot of newspaper and television coverage. Some of it was favorable, probably reflecting the natural sympathy many reporters feel for the student rebel who challenges the educational orthodoxy. The uproar so upset science educators that they brought out a really big gun to squelch the high school student. Bruce Alberts, president of the National Academy of Sciences, personally responded to Danny in an editorial published in the Denver Post. The National Academy of Sciences is the most prestigious organization of scientists in the United States, and so its president is effectively the official voice of the scientific establishment. 
Danny should have felt very honored to be engaged by so powerful an adversary. Unfortunately, Alberts replied with the stock arguments that evolutionary naturalists used to silence discussion on this topic. He identified dissent from evolutionary naturalism with religion, and hence with untestable speculation that science must disregard. As a clincher, he recommended that those interested in understanding how science works may wish to read a recent book, The Beak of the Finch by Jonathan Weiner, which describes new studies on the Galapagos Islands that confirm and elaborate on Darwin's original work. Evolution happens all around us. Alberts was referring to studies which show that the average size of finch beaks on particular islands vary from year to year in response to environmental changes. I discussed the Wiener book in Chapter 4 of Reason in Balance. Anyone who has even the slightest acquaintance with the evolution creation controversy would know that such minor variation is readily accepted by even the strictest biblical creationists. The evolution creation controversy is not about minor variations, but about how things like birds come into existence in the first place. One of the truly bizarre things about our current cultural situation is that leading figures of the science establishment seem genuinely amazed that the citizens do not accept finch beak variation as proof of the claim that humans, like all animals and plants, are accidental products of a purposeless universe in which only material processes have operated from the beginning. It's an absurd situation, isn't it? Educators aren't allowed to address the issues about which their students and the general public are most concerned. When teachers challenge students to think about how their worldviews affect their understanding of the creation-evolution controversy, so-called civil liberties lawyers censor the teaching by threatening to bring lawsuit that the school district can't afford to defend. The president of the National Academy of Sciences writes an essay so simplistic that it insults the intelligence of a well-informed high school student. He urges a bright high school student not to think for himself, but to trust the findings of a research community that thinks it can settle the questions of our origins by defining finch beak variations as evolution. How did the scientists get themselves into such a mess? It has to do with the way Darwinists think and how they define science. And we'll start chapter four in the next video. Thanks so much for listening. Please reach down, click like, and subscribe. Come back for our next video. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.